Okay. Um, I have a colleague right down the road from me at the University of Wyoming by the name of Pat Keycut. And uh, in addition to being a wonderful human being, Pat's an amazing painter. Uh, Pat's a faculty member at the, in the art and art history department at the University of Wyoming. Um, and he's done a ton of Western landscape work over the years. Uh, he served as one of the organizers of the Sesquicentennial Colorado River Exploring Expedition. Again, the project I mentioned before break. Uh, he was the lead artist for Vision in Place, the book put together with um, some wonderful art contributions for the 150th anniversary of John Wesley Powell's famous expedition down the river system. Uh, so we did that in 2019. He was also a through tripper uh, on that expedition, meaning he went from Green River, Wyoming, all the way down to Lake Mead, over a thousand river miles uh, over the summer of 2019 and generated some um, really uh, thoughtful, inspired work uh, while, while, while floating the river uh, in conjunction with that trip. Pat also contributed uh, artwork to the forthcoming book uh, on the Colorado River Compact Centennial. Uh, that book is called Cornerstone at the Confluence, Navigating the Colorado River Compact's Next Century. University of Arizona Press will be dropping it on the market, hopefully November 24th of 2022, the exact date when the compact was signed in Santa Fe. Uh, Pat spends his time in both Santa Fe and in Laramie. Uh, and if you're interested in seeing his work, his pieces, they're displayed along the southern edge, excuse me, the northern edge, the northern wall of the multi-purpose room just down the hallway here. A bunch of different, is that oil prints, Pat? Oil paintings. Yeah, oil paintings, large uh, scale. Please take a look at them. They're, they're breathtaking. They're, they're um, yeah, again, they're inspired. So uh, on that note, allow me to uh, introduce or, or uh, seize the podium to uh, my colleague, Pat Kika. Thank you all for being here. It's a real honor to be here. You get an invitation that has Wallace Stegner involved. On, and uh, it was, um, I couldn't believe it, Stegner. I've learned so much about the West from reading Wallace Stegner. So um, it's, again, a very, a, a very much of an honor. Thank you all, and thank you, especially um, Jason, Matt, and Daryl for um, bringing me on board the river and the river community has been an incredible um, learning experience. I'm new to this. Um, I'm a green um, river person. So um, this conference has uh, uh, just compounded my knowledge of the river and um, also has me thinking that I have a lot more to learn from the river and from this river family. Also, thanks, Jan and Chris and Spencer for all the help um, landing me here and um, being such great hosts for the center. Like Jason said, um, in 2019, I served as the Sesquicentennial Colorado River Exploring Expedition's lead artist. I believe I was invited onto that trip because of my interest in traveling in the American Western landscape and my interest in American art history. Like Jason said, we launched our boats from on Green River, Wyoming, floated through the canyons and pulled our rivers or pulled our boats or disembarked from our boats on Lake Mead above the confluence of the Virgin and Colorado Rivers. It's a thousand miles. It took 70 days, and I was one of three through trippers. We had many other artists involved, and the trip was basically designed around Powell's first trip down the, down the river. And we used Powell's um, this anniversary, or the 150th anniversary, as a narrative structure to launch a art, science, and humanities expedition. And basically the idea was to provide rafts and platforms for conversation. And the conversation not only, um, of course, uh, give us time to think about the past, but also think about what the future might hold. 
This, this map, um, you've seen this map a lot. And this is one map that I drew. Uh, like Powell, I love maps, and I was, it was very important for me um, to draw the map of the basin. And the logistics um, also overlaid with the maps was um, important for me to try to understand. Trip leader, Tom Minkley, a colleague of Jason and I's, um, approached me on a cold March evening I believe it was in 2016. He had a question for me, thought he would just drop by on his way home. I said, sure, Tom, come by. And he had a question, later I had a question too. Tom, I think, had just finished reading that fantastic book about Alexander von Humboldt, the biography that came out recently. And in that book, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a passage there where von Humboldt um, critiqued Thomas Jefferson and kind of maybe pointed his finger at him and said, you never should have let, let Lewis and Clark out there without a trained artist. And he understood that the visuals could, also, could overlay with the science and reach a broader public. And we just mentioned, or we just heard um, how important that is with Brad Udall's comments about how important it was for the people on the front range to see that grassland um, burn with the Marshall Fire in December. Incredible. And so um, not only the actual um, witnessing of the landscape, but as artists, we are responsible for making visualization, making um, at least in my case, um, holding a mirror up to not only the beauty of the American West, but also the realities that we're facing. So I said yes to Tom's question quickly and um, knew I had a lot to learn. I had one question for Tom, and I, my question went to him was, do you have your permits? And he said, yes, I'm pretty sure he had um, a few permits and had his fingers crossed behind his back. This, this image in particular um, is important, and it helped, um, I believe, the environmental movement of the 1970s gain a holistic um, view of planet Earth and understood what a special planet we live on. And away we go. I had a lot to learn. Again, I was very, very green and um, was excited to face um, all of the challenges that traveling through the canyons might offer. This is an earlier trip um, from the 2019 trip. Um, but there I am with Tom going through the Grand Canyon. I learned how to connect my hat to the back of my um, collar. <laughs> Where we go. Whoops, I advanced this. So John Wesley Powell also um, learned his lessons from von Humboldt and quickly um, recruited Thomas Moran to um, join him on the second trip down the canyons. This, this, is a, uh, this is an important painting by Thomas Moran, who has just landed this painting. And this painting in particular has always impressed me with how effective the visualization of the Western landscape can be. This painting is the Grand, uh, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and was instrumental in giving Congress an idea of how special some of these Western landscapes are. And what Congress understood for the first time in a Eurocentric government's governance was they recognized that Yellowstone or certain landscapes had an aesthetic value or biological value, and that value outweighed the value of the natural resources that could have been harvested from that landscape. So, so Moran was coming off a high note with this painting, and Powell went out of his way to recruit him to join him on the second, on the on the on his second trip. I think, I think uh, from all of my research, uh, Moran, Thomas Moran was um, a European trained painter, and he didn't spend that much time on the river itself. So I had a backup plan if things weren't working on the, on the scree trip, where it's just like, hey, get me to Moran Point, and uh, I'll go by land or on my horse. But anyway, I was, I'm a river. I'm a, I wouldn't have left the river um, 
But anyway, in the back of my mind, I had an exit strategy. And so this painting actually complemented the first painting I showed you and um, is in a fantastic painting. I always thought that, that the paint, this painting was um, particularly interesting because it looks like the rain is kind of raining upwards and we witnessed that in the Grand Canyon. So he, Moran wasn't just making these things up. So Moran and these visual images helped um, protect some very important landscapes. So many painters um, like Thomas Moran um, came out west, brought tremendous skills, again, uh, European trained, uh, trained artists, and um, used the Transcontinental Railroad that came through Laramie and um, came over the Green River. Um, this painting is of the Green River. Again, another Thomas Moran painting of Green River Buttes. Interstate 80 blasts right through that butte now. And um, like um, Powell and Moran, we use the same launching point and use the same, basically the same route out to Green River, Wyoming. The railroad um, kind of overlaid with um, Manifest Destiny, it tilted the scales on the war against Native people. And um, strangely, you know, a, a, a way to think of these paintings is that I've thought of is not only did they help protect some landscapes, but they also kind of encouraged Manifest Destiny and some exploitation of the West. Moran ended up working for the railroad later on in his life. Although Moran is an incredible oil painter, I was really, I'm mostly impressed with his field drawings. Field drawing is difficult. Um, conditions are challenging. And it's overwhelming to find a spot to set up and make a composition. The space is so gigantic. There's so many details. And the thing that draws me to Moran's work in particular is his delicate line, his accuracy on the, de the details of the horizon line and the geology, but also a sense of what not to put into his paintings. There's a minimalism in his drawings that was really attractive to me. Absolutely impressive. And I was thinking about it last night. The areas that he decides to leave kind of undeveloped, I believe, is effective in that they speak to the quiet and the immense space that we experience in the West. Here's another example of Moran's field drawings. Excellent use of watercolors. His color, he's a colorist that, that borders on the fantastic until you get out there and you actually see these kind of things in the sunset. I've traveled wide and far to dig into archives um, and look at these and handle these um, Moran field drawings. Uh, the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma has been um, real generous opening their doors for me, as well as Yellowstone National Park Archives, which I should note is on its 150th anniversary. So going um, for 30 years, I've been avoiding these kind of landscapes that Moran and Albert Beardstadt have painted. I committed myself to being an artist on a floor in Boulder, Colorado, while I was in my first month maybe of painting too. Um, as a young artist, I woke up one morning after dreaming about making paintings for you know, the fifth night in a row. And before I stood up, I remember still, it was a spring morning, I had a little futon on the floor and I made a wedding commitment kind of, I made a wedding-like commitment to art. And I said, I wanna be artist forever. I said, art, I wanna grow old with you. I promise that I'll do my best to, um, to work, work with you. And my challenge, that opened up a lot of challenges for me. One of the challenges was, what, would a, what, what do you do as somebody who's so interested in Western landscape while recognizing that the work of Moran and Bierstadt and many others have already taken on the most spectacular landscapes, the most um, dynamic and maybe now most recognizable landscapes. That was something that I really wanted to recognize 
and see how my work might um, build off the shoulders of those, like we say, giants. And I recognize that there's a lot of land in between those most protected landscapes. And these landscapes were easy for me to access. And they also were a chance for me to reflect the beauty that I saw in the Western landscape. Excuse me. As well as showing the reality of the Western landscape. So not just always focusing on the most spectacular and protected landscapes. I'm interested in these in-between landscapes that maybe that people drive through to get to the protected landscapes. Living in Boulder, Colorado is frustrating that I would have friends that would drive in from Kansas City and talk about reading books or being bored out of their mind as they drive across the Great Plains. But then they get to the front foothills of the Rocky Mountains and they're all ready to engage in landscape and the environment. I've always thought like that was the like reading the end of a book or skipping to the end of the movie. How could one thing be disconnected from the other? So anyway, these less protected landscapes were interesting to me because they showed land and they showed another perspective on how we treat our landscape. This is typical of that kind of uh, situation. And um, I've always described Laramie as an ocean of snow and this powerboat stuck in a in a snow drift on a gigantic um, gooseneck trailer seemed to be a perfect description of that. So I've spent a lot of time by myself, alone in lonely places, working as a solo painter. There's nothing more alone than one, a painter studio. You just walk in and nobody says anything and you just do your job and you make a painting. Um, it's a very quiet existence, especially if you're spending time in places like this. If you can believe this, this is um, a place that I um, made paintings. This is the high point of, I believe this is Kansas. So this is Mount Sunflower in Kansas. This is a trailer that I pulled. It's called the Mobile Research Studio, also known shortly as the Misses. So this is how I typically, um, move around, I have my, my artistic practice has a gigantic carbon footprint. My artistic neighborhood, or where I operate, goes from Great Falls, Montana, in the north, east to Dodge City, Kansas, and I gotta say thank you to Wallace Stegner for helping me understand the eastern boundary of my neighborhood, and the 100th meridian, and south to El Paso, and now Marfa, Texas, this is from the Llano Estacado in eastern New Mexico. And west out to uh, Reno, Nevada. This is actually east of Flagstaff up of Interstate 40. Many of my paintings before the scree trip, um, I, I kind of describe as like empty stage sets where the actors have had an action, a play, an engagement, and they've abandoned the stage and left their props sitting there for a viewer to approach and maybe kind of construct what kind of narrative might have happened at that point. Oftentimes they kind of look like crime scenes and oftentimes they kind of are. So Scree offered me a lot of challenges. Um, first challenge was to step away from my truck and the misses and learn how to rig and row a boat. But there were also conceptual challenges and compositional challenges and, so, and, and social challenges for me. Conceptually, these spaces, the Grand Canyon, Dinosaur, um, Canyonlands, were the kind of landscapes that I've been trying to avoid, figuring that those, image, those artists and photographers had already done a really great job describing those landscapes. Now here I am facing those landscape and being asked to put more images out of those places. I don't think the Grand Canyon needs any more images. It might be the most photographed place in the West. So what am I supposed to do with that? Also compositionally, as you can see, I prefer a low horizon and a big sky. In the canyons, horizon lines go straight up often. That was different. Anyway, also just learning how to survive and live 
and um, work and camp um, for 70 days was a challenge. And then another challenge, like I said, was just um, engaging with all of the great folks that we had on our river trip. I think there were over 70 or 80 different folks that would come on for shorter sections of time. River trips are highly communal and highly social and um, there's so much to learn there and people are talking and observing. This is very different than the practice that I've had for 30 years. Um, so here I am, I think in dinosaur um, and working on a drawing probably on a layover day. So rigging and rowing a boat, um, as many of you know that we're on the trip, there's a handful of us that were on this trip, um, knew that I was um, learning on the fly, um, learning how to rig and row a boat is, there's a lot to it. There's a whole new language first to learn about doing those kind of things. So um, I was excited and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm still excited to continue on with that. Another thing that was a challenge was to figure out what, what, what kind of materials I would bring on board with me and how, many, how much of those materials and what would be the most um, efficient and, um, and, a, and a safe way to transport my materials. I used uh, mostly uh, drawing materials, watercolors, and um, I brought some woodcut supplies with me too. So you can see here, um, my setup, I've got a dry box here in the top uh, left-hand corner, and that's where I um, had my sketchbooks and some more, uh, some nicer watercolor paper so, that I would use on, water, on layover days. So you can see me working on what I would call more refined um, field drawings. So on layover days, I would break out my watercolors and kind of rework some of my daily sketches. One thing that I thought about um, with my system here, again, I was learning on the, on the fly, was maybe, it, and this occurred to me, oh, perfect timing, um, John's here. Uh, my, my, um, as I watched my boat flip in Cataract Canyon and disappear down to um, Lake Powell, I wondered how smart it was for me to put my finished work in the same box as my set of watercolors. My high dollar watercolors have really strong pigments. And I wondered when we flipped my boat back over and opened up my dry box, if my finished drawings from the, all the way from the upper basin down to lower basin at that point would be kind of in a not so dry box. And my watercolors would be um, kind of floating around in a tie-dye um, mix of pigments and the, and the river could have uh, helped me um, paint those or change those paintings quite a bit. But we had really good equipment and um, thankfully uh, all of the work that I'd done up to that point were, um, was in good shape. But from going on from there, I separated my finished work out of that box. This is an example of a, of a daily drawing. Quickly, I realized that the best place, I would, I would put a rigorous kind of schedule on for myself. I wanted to get a daily drawing of every camp or every place that we stopped. And so with that, I would wake up before dawn often, and um, that would be the time for me to kind of, one, look at stars, watch the canyon light change with the early morning sun, wait for Tom Minkley, our trip leader, to fire up that blaster and get some coffee going. He was up really early, which was great. Have a quick cup of coffee with Tom, and then take off up and down river to make my daily drawings. I'd give myself a half hour, 20 minute to document some feature of the river that I thought was interesting, and then get back to camp and engage with the breakfast scene and um, do the work that needs to be done to um, load up camp and head down river, check out the river map, see what we had in store. Later on in the day, as many of you that have spent time on the river, isn't as predictable as the morning sessions. So um, I felt like I could get a drawing done in the morning and everything after that would be gravy.
we've got here. Here's some examples of those more refined dry, uh, watercolors that we do on layover days. We had really high water flows in 2017, and that would push us along. So we had a couple extra um, layover days, which was fantastic. Um, for me to be able to kind of fuss over these drawings and just set up and basically have a studio day. And this is the kind of work I would do here. The next, um, the next section of these this uh, presentation, I'll just kind of flip through the paintings that are here in the, um, what are they called, multi-purpose room? Yeah, and so these paintings um, in this presentation and as they're laid out in the multi-purpose room, are in sequence going from um, Wyoming all the way through the canyon. So I'll just flip through these images and um, talk to you a little bit about um, them. So I had over 100 field drawings to choose from. I, didn't, I knew not all of them were worthy of an oil painting. So I had to choose a few to kind of re best represent the sections of the river. I know we've heard a lot about the upper and lower basins. In my mind, I had the rivers kind of broken up into three different sections. The first section being roughly from Green River, Utah, through Dinosaur, Uinta Basin, and Desolation and Grays Canyon to Green River, Utah. So that's what I would call the upper section. And then there's a middle section, Green River, Utah, through Canyonlands and over Lake Mead. I'd consider that the middle section. And then the lower section being the Grand Canyon and out onto Lake Mead. I'm sorry, the, um, the middle section included um, Lake Powell, which we um, started calling Reservoir Powell, just to be more consistent. There were people that we met in the houseboats and in marinas on um, Reservoir Powell that didn't even know that it was a river. <laughs> And it wasn't, it was a reservoir. But anyway, we've found a lot of confused people on Reservoir Powell. So um, this is from um, Flaming Gorge Reservoir, one of our first camps um, when we launched from Green River, um, Wyoming. Uh, we were getting snowed on the day before we were launching. I mean, snowed on and blown on. The day when we launched, there was sleet and hail and we floated for 11 miles before we hit flat water and needed to be towed across um, Flaming Gorge, Portage the, the dam, Flaming Gorge Dam, and then we were free. We had uh, five or 600 miles of open water. One thing that you can notice in this painting is that the, the mood and the sky um, is kind of gray and steely like it is um, up in Wyoming at this time. So I wanted to make sure that my paintings not only reflected the landscape, but also kind of the mood and the weather. We had about four days of winter on our trip, maybe one day of spring, and then we had summer, and we had deep summer, and then deeper summer. <laughs> This is in Dinosaur near um, Jones Hole. These two pines I thought were sweet. And you can see that field drawing that I had earlier. This is a translation of that. I learned a lot about the color burnt sienna in this trip. And um, that can go a lot of different directions. You add a little yellow to it, you make it go one way, you can add some blue to it and get some nice violets. But burnt sienna was the, the key factor for the canyon. This is in the Uinta Basin. It's a road cut. I've always, anytime I come explore in Utah, I'm always express, impressed by the, the road cuts that are, that are here that go up the canyon. Anybody who's been up the Moki Dugway can attest to that impressive um, road cut. This is a road cut that went around a horseshoe bend in the Uinta Basin. And I have to note that the Uinta Basin was an in, impressive place to go through. It was wild and it was used by many, many um, different stakeholders and different, it, there was only, I guess there's only 11 or 12 people that flow through the Uinta Basin a year and we doubled that score and probably more than doubled that score with our, um, with our trip. It was wild, we saw a lot of bighorn sheep and I thought it was pretty interesting to be there. These are crude oil tanks, a lot of extractive industry, of course, in the Uinta Basin. 
Desolation Canyon was a favorite section of mine. It was, uh, maybe it was a favorite section because um, we had such great people on this part of the trip. And, um, but the landscape was great. And as we were floating through, um, Desolation and Grays Canyon got uh, a designation, a special designation as Wild Scenic River. So we were really, really happy to be there for that and had some BLM Rangers come rowing up to us ready to celebrate with us for that. They had to bring us the news and um, they worked pretty hard to, to come uh, join us, which we were very, very happy about. This is Labyrinth Canyon. I was, I was really excited to see this telephone pole that had fallen into the river. I spent most of my time at the University of Montana painting telephone poles, if you can believe that. They're omnipresent, and for some reason I thought, you might as well deal with them. They're all over these in-between places and less protected landscapes. And um, I finally saw my old icon, and it's falling into the river, and I thought that might be um, telling. The other thing you can notice in this painting is um, this white foam. And a lot of times you'd run across this white foam that would show up um, downstream of heavy agricultural in, uh, areas. And of course, our experience on Lake Powell was amazing and eye-opening. And um, we had a lot of good folks on Lake Powell with us too. We lashed all of our boats together and had one motor and just moved across Lake Powell for about a week, eight days, at, at three miles an hour. The cool thing about this for me was I had all day to draw. Going that slow, I could set up my sketchbook and look out and the composition wouldn't change for like an hour <laughs> or more. And so I got a lot of drawings of Lake Powell, Reservoir Powell. And it's um, pretty wild to recognize that this is the Navajo generating plant and those um, stacks are not there. So this painting was painted and in less than a year, um, it's already kind of a historic painting. A, a moon had risen over the site and um, I have to thank Jason for titling this. I'm, as you can tell probably from the slide presentation, not that poetic as far as titling my work and Jason came up with this title, I believe. So um, we, this is the, the Crossing of the Fathers and I believe that's, uh, I forget the name of that butte, Escalante Butte or no? Anyway, this is where uh, the crossing of the fathers were, and we thought of all the cultures crossing in this place. This is a painting of the Glen Canyon Dam. This is one of the spookiest places, I think, I, or spookiest experiences I had on the river. We were fortunate to have um, lined up uh, a motor trip from Lee's Ferry up to get below the, um, the dam and experience the scale of it and to really observe the sandstone that the, that the, um, that the dam's anchored into. I had a lot of things to think about, but just trying to, to keep it moving, I'll um, just talk about how um, you can see the seeps in the sandstone now. And if you look at images of these same canyon walls while they were building the dam, before the dam was put up, there aren't those seeps. So it says that the, the land itself is absorbing um, the water from Lake Powell and kind of seeping it out through the down river side of this dam. That's, that's spooky <laughs> to be there, um, let alone um, the, the dam kind of seemed like a gateway and it seemed like a blocked gateway and I could imagine it kind of like, a, again, like a stage set. If you could peel that away, I could imagine all of the, the kivas and the spirits and the sediments and the kind of drowned culture that was in there underneath the level of the lake and it was, a, it was haunting to me. Unnerving. This is deep in the Grand Canyon. Mad Cat Camp was an intense place to be for me. I appreciated these real narrows, uh, this narrow part of the Grand Canyon. Um, it feels a little claustrophobic and that was a challenge for me. Again, Mr. Big Sky and wide open spaces. The, there's an intensity um, in these uh, narrows in the Grand Canyon. Matcat Camp is great because it has these benches, these kind of 
formations that uh, made it really nice to sit on and to make some drawings with those benches. It was just like these perfect seats, um, not only for me, but for rattlesnakes as well. The other thing that was, um, that is kind of foreboding about um, Matt Cat Camp and um, thinking about the next day going down river is that, um, as many of you probably know that once you launch from Madcap, it is you're going through crystal, granite, and um, lava falls in that same day. So you got a lot to look forward to. And I thought I was curious how these two logs kind of um, formed an X and kind of landed on this rock uh, along with the rattlesnake. So there's a foreboding nature to Madcap Camp, although it's a great place to hang out. Moving along downriver um, to this spot. So we um, made it our intentions to motor out onto Lake Mead. And with our GPSs, we found um, the location of where the natural confluence of the Virgin and the Colorado River would come together. And right at that point was this, um, we called an unmarked buoy floating right there. And it was just the strangest surreal thing to have this kind of, it looked like an unmarked grave or something. We thought, I thought of it as an unmarked grave, this kind of, this marker for this thing that had been lost. I was lucky to find out yesterday from somebody here that this is actually a USGS monitoring um, buoy that monitors the evaporation rate. So thanks, um, Mina, I believe, told me that yesterday. So, um, so, that, so thanks, I'm still gaining information from the river community. So thanks for that. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a strange and place to end a river trip for sure. Um, but I was happy to have it there as a, as a marker rather than just nothing there. This is a painting of our last camp on Lake Mead. We spent the last night on the Nevada side of Lake Mead. And it was really unnerving. I got used to a lot of things. I got used to everything on the river. And now here we were camped on kind of a trashy, remote bank of Lake Mead. There were diapers and a tree had been cut down and we were underneath the flight pattern for Harry Reid Airport. The sounds of the machine of our culture was present. I could hear trucks going up and down I-15. I could hear the machines of air conditioners and all the things that we plug into were evident. Our, the river and the canyons were so quiet, the night skies were so dark, the sound of the river was the only thing that you would hear. And this was just such a different experience. Low water levels, it was hot, and mostly just the, the, the vibration of our cultural machine that was working was unnerving. It was hot and I could um, I've imagined continuing on downriver. I really wanted to con continue. I missed Tracy, my wife, and I missed ice cubes for sure. But I really felt like I wanted to continue on and watch the bubble line kind of hit the sandbars down by Yuma maybe and just land our rafts onto some dry bank and walk away from them at that point. Reentry is rough. And reentry in 2019 is really rough. <laughs> So I wanted to make this painting from downriver. This is off of the scree trip, but for me, kind of completed this, the, the cycle. And this is Bullhead City, flags at half mast. This was actually painted before we launched. The culture and um, the, the government had been shut down for the border wall. There's um, a form, I saw a formation of um, military um, jets kind of flying up to Nellis Air Force Base and thought, wow, this is again another image of kind of a, a, the noisy uh, re-entry culture that, I, that we emerged out of. Since being off, since finishing those paintings, I've worked on this, um, on a, on a series, and I have many, many of these kind of paintings. But while we were floating down the river, it was so hard to imagine all of the work that we put to, into 
making it through the rapids and landing it on beaches and working with the forces of the river, just the power of the river to create those canyons and to float us um, downstream. It's hard not to imagine, where does all this water go? We know there's 40 million people in the lower basin, but I could close my eyes and I could imagine all the little roots down in the agricultural districts down by Yuma and the Imperial Valley, drawing that water up into the plants and into the fruits. And those fruits being packed into boxes, those boxes going into trains and trucks and being distributed throughout the country and throughout the world. Being distributed six floors up in the Stegner Center and we've been enjoying those melons and limes and watermelons and peaches and micro greens right here, thinking that we all take a bite out of the Colorado River, that it's sacrificed. And coming from New Mexico, I had to throw in a green chili cheeseburger. <laughs> I know a lot of alfal alfalfa is grown and that alfalfa magically turns into burgers and cheese and uh, of course green chili and um, for Colorado, I've got a Coors Light there, right? Tap the Rockies. So, um, so this is the series that I've been working on um, th throughout the later part of the pandemic. And it's been really great to kind of step away from the burnt sienna and get into some of these tropical colors, <laughs> getting to play oranges and greens off of each other. So that's how I've landed um, my work here. And um, I am excited to move forward. I Although I've been on the road for 30 years, I think a lot about the river, I talk about the river, and talk about hopefully getting the next permit and continuing on with more adventures down the river. It's the way to go. I've got a lot to learn, and I want to continue that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't know if we're doing Slido or um, straightforward questions. We probably should set it for the next panel. Okay, time to go. All right, so, thank you. Thanks so much, Pat. We're honored to have you as the artist from headwaters to mouth in a different sense, right?